Welcome to the Open Era Podcast. My name is Devang Desai and I'm joined as always by Mr. Simon Bushel. Bush, it's been a few weeks, sir. How are you doing? Uh, well, I'm I'm quite sick, um, but <laughs> I've been all right the last three weeks, but the last two days has been a bit of a bit under the weather, as they say in Britain. Seems to be going around, change of the seasons, et cetera, et cetera. I'm getting a uh seasonal nosebleeds which is definitely tmi for a dear listener but how does that work i don't know i'm, I'm sure i should probably get this looked into more but um it's humidity etc cetera, etc cetera. if any doctors are listening please uh hit me up <laughs> on microsoft teams no uh, <laughs> email's probably good uh tennis wise bush how much have you consumed post us open enough i would say it's definitely been out of the whole calendar year, the least tennis that I've watched post US Open. I think you definitely hit this point in the season where you start to feel a little bit of burnout from the tour. And I think that's ironic given some of the stories that we're going to cover this week. But definitely as a viewer, I've definitely felt it a bit. September was a was a light month for me. Yeah, I shut off pretty much as well. I caught some Davis Cup, of course, because who doesn't love that jacked up tournament that is not the same but still kind of intriguing and also intriguing to see some of the big guns show up so i followed that and also i I have been locked in a bit in the asian swing just because i feel like it is still a bit of a novelty to have it back after of course a few difficult difficult years uh with that whole pandemic and stuff but we're back in asia like trying to catch some of these matches but also Subject to some horrendous time change <laughs> scenarios, including for Sinner and Alcaraz in China, exactly what the ATP was looking for, Bush, in terms of growing the game and having the biggest stars in big markets. They got what they were looking for. They also got a pretty damn good match. Um, I, I didn't catch this live myself as hard as I tried, but... From what I did watch afterwards, I was impressed. How about yourself? I thought it was one of the best matches of the season, truth be told. I thought these two were full value for the final, I think the full value to be the number one and two ranked players in the world, the top two seeds at this tournament. It was a very special final, and it's been quite the month for Carlos Alcaraz since going down to our man, Botic, He's gone on a tear. He's not lost. I think he's 11, 11 and 0 through September. So he's put to bed any concerns at the back end of the year. It definitely just looked like to me that he played far too much tennis and the Olympics had kind of compressed his schedule. And then it's a reminder, oh yeah, this Spanish wonderkin is, is pretty special. He's he's really damn good. I enjoyed the the picks of him and Sinner, Team Sinner, taking the the private jet over to Shanghai. Pro athletes, they're just like us, Simon, right? Uh, Yes, absolutely. (laughs) But I I do think an interesting subtext about all this, and I think we're going to talk about WADA coming after Sinboy a bit more, is the fact that Sinner has been able to, I think, cut out the noise and somehow maintain a level that I, I am frankly a bit surprised by considering all everything that's going on because i thought it would be a bit more of a problem for him are you surprised he's been able to just play this well because it is something i think that we're maybe not giving enough credit to in terms of how rare that is potentially but you do hear about this don't you from his camp the the majority of people that talk about him who have either coached him or have been around him talk about his ability to block out everything to stay focused to compartmentalize all the things that are going on around him. And I think that combined with just a a game which has such a high floor means that he's going to be in a lot of matches. Even when he's playing not particularly well, he still wins matches just because he's he's so good. Like his his average rally ball, his ball striking, he's one of the best ball strikers to ever yeah. ever lace up a pair of tennis boots. Tennis boots? Mixing metaphors here, tennis sure. shoes. I mean, sure. What, yeah, yeah. Let's go with it. Run with it, everyone. <laughs> we missed all of September. My verbiage is gone. <laughs> I know. Words? What are they? What are words? I'm not actually that surprised. I actually do think the thing that would be interesting to know now is how is this going to affect him with all the water stuff that we can come on to in a minute? 
because I think that's far more damning. I think that's far more that that has the potential for far more seriousness than the legal ramifications of the first or the both of the drugs tests, which has previously happened. So I think if you're going to see a blip in that at all, you might start seeing it now. Regarding Alcaraz, Bush, you you mentioned responding to that that weird loss to Botic, and there was a hilarious clip of Daniel Medvedev post match after losing to Carlos, saying that he needed to change his first name to Botic to have a chance. But I do I did find a, a random I think it was on uh, our tennis uh, bastion of sanity that it is. I found a, a comment indicating that it was like. During the same match, you can say that Carlos Alcaraz is unplayable and at his peak, no one else can touch him. And then a few minutes later, be like, how is this guy ever going to win again at the same time? <laughs> because there's just such extremes. But he did show us again how high that ceiling can go. And it is very freaking high. Like I think that's... Really, really interesting to me is the response to maybe Sinner also taking over on and off the court storylines, being basically the face of tennis in the United States, winning the tournament there. He took the mantle a bit. And I think as much as we like this idea of a big two, I did find it interesting that they're they're asking Carlos a lot more now that like they're a one on one relationship. And and Carlos, I think, impressed was like, we're not like friends, friends, but we get on. And obviously, them taking the jet together to Shanghai indicates they do. But I did I did kind of uh, pin my ears back when I he- I heard him talk about the Sinner Wada stuff and how he said, and so did Novak say that wasn't great that this is kind of surrounding the game and it's not right like let's let's be serious it's really not like this is how a lot of casual sports fans are hearing about tennis in the mainstream so i I, i'm just now i'm listening a little closer to carlos alcaraz bush because he's in an interesting spot where he's still clearly the guy but his main rival has got like these weird dubious charges and he's also like contesting amazing matches against him yeah, absolutely. I wonder, just given where we are in this rivalry, whether or not people are starting to try and find narratives, like they're starting to try and figure out what is the the nature of this rivalry, both from a personal and from a tennis perspective. Obviously, like the 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 doping charges, I think, throw a wrinkle into this. And I think what you're alluding to in terms of how Alcaraz has, has, has talked about it is is certainly one part of this. I think they, they get on really well. Like you can mm-hmm. it's very evident mm-hmm. that there's there's a level of warmth but, but warmness between the two of them. And also like a level of, of sheer respect as well. Like they they seem like two very, you know, nice young men who like actually have been um have been taught, I think, to have respect for the game and for their opponents. Uh, whether or not that extends to whether or not you'd want to dope or not, I don't know, or allegedly dope. I should say um, that's an entirely separate story, but I think on the on the tennis side of it, it's it's far more interesting than I think the personal side of it because they were level going into twenty twenty four in terms of match wins and losses, like they were even, and everyone thought that rivalry was only heading in a certain direction. Not anymore, right? I think you can say for certain, despite the closeness of some of these match results, is that Carlos Alcaraz is is sort of he's owning this rivalry on the on the court like he plays the bigger moments more strongly and i think he's blown center off the court in ways that we haven't really seen in the in the the opposite direction so i think that's where i'd look at really is that how is how is yannick center going to solve carlos alcaraz on a tennis court because that's the so evenly matched and when you can start and when you can have just a, a slight mental edge on your opponent it really counts for a lot so that's what I'm looking forward to going for the rest of the season into 2025 is that tennis wise, does Sinner have a response here? Hopefully, because it's it would make for a very, very good rivalry for the rest of their careers. Yeah, that's very well put. And if you remember last year at, in Beijing, Sinner won that semifinal pretty handily in the second set. And, and, and perhaps that kind of set up what was to come in January at the Australian Open, which is a, a major title. It's been the year for Alcaraz 2024 against Sinner. He set at Bush at Indian Wells, at Roland Garros, and now at Beijing. 
very, very fascinating to see where this rivalry kicks on to. I did also enjoy all the people meeting up in Shanghai. This should be good uh, in terms of the quality of tennis bush. But I I want to touch on something quickly before we, we get to the WTA. But did you watch any of the Labor Cup? Did you care at all about the Labor Cup? <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask on the Labour Cup, Dev. You know, must know this at this point. I don't really care for it a whole lot. I watched, I think I watched content around it more than the actual matches. I think the actual personal interactions, obviously Federer being there made a lot of the headlines. The relationship between some of the players, uh, Ben Shelton's antics of falling over the barricade caught the eye, as did uh, Grigor Dimitrov and Carlos Alcaraz. But yeah, my interaction with this tournament has definitely gone to like viewing it through Instagram as opposed to actually sitting down and watching the matches. Love Bjorn. Love Johnny Mac. I mean, love, maybe not, but <laughs> they've been part of our lives for so long. But to, to get this thing going again, they got to get fed to captain with someone else. And whenever Nadal hangs it up, that'll be obvious. But yeah, they need to, to in, infuse this with some new juice, some new blood, and also start taking it back to places that don't get tennis all the time. Because I think I think Luke might have mentioned this in the Discord, but I think it's one thing if you're going to, to unique locales that don't get slammed tennis all the time, if you're going to take it out of London. But maybe some non-traditional markets next would be the next call because... And I don't mean Saudi Arabia. I think I'm <laughs> talking about some other places, other other cultures that love tennis and that produce tennis players, but maybe don't get the biggest tournament. So I would like to see that as well. And obviously a joint event because, yeah, I'm with you. I did not watch much at all. I know some tennis fans in my life did and did like the comfort of having having a, a ability to tune in and see Fed in the crowd because they need that warm blanket, I guess, because we're so fractured <laughs> as a society. I don't know. I'm done with it for now as well until we see some changes. Okay, WTA, Simon. A lot of events, perhaps headlined by BHM, Beatrice Haddad Maya, winning in Korea, winning in Seoul, beating Daria Kasatkina in the final, an event in which Emma Rajikanu made a run, Simon. Mm-hmm. She's in the news a lot, but I also want to shout out Sonai Kartal for winning in Tunisia. That's a huge win for her. I know, I know how it works in the tennis industrial complex, <laughs> especially from a tennis nation. You get the golden child, and then you get the also rants, and there's a lot of also rants in the UK tennis scene. So awesome to see Kartal get the limelight. Absolutely. Really... Interesting point in the tennis calendar. We seem to say this every year, don't we, of what the post-US Open landscape looks like. The WTA is fascinating. We had, I think we've had 10 tournaments, 10 tour-level <laughs> tournaments since the US Open. And before you get into the, obviously, into the 1,000 levels um, uh, over the next few weeks, and obviously, like, currently going on at the moment. So you, you could make the argument that October is a, a huge month for WTA in terms of points in terms of prize money in terms of prestige of some of these tournaments coming up and the fields that are going to be there september not so much in some ways september is a, is a strange one of being all over the world on multiple different surfaces on multiple different court speeds uh different altitudes there's lots of things going on so i think the ones that you circle were the ones that i would look to as well the radicanu story is interesting as well like just played well injured and then done i think from the sounds of things doesn't sound like she's coming back this mm-hmm. season um a really sad story because it looked like we were starting to see some some green shoots of recovery again so i think my summary of the wta for september is just a bit weird it's just a, a bit of a strange time thanks to the beauty of time zones i did get to stumble into coco Gauff, naimi osaka bush live uh in beijing unfortunately that was cut short as well Naomi having to retire. I saw she took to the gram to clap back at some haters. And extremely well, I thought she did nail them. But I also know that that's never a great sign because we all know social media is poison. That being said, <laughs> that was appointment viewing. I thought that was excellent to see as much as we could of it. I mean, it is what it is regarding injuries in Naomi. And I think like the, the comeback is going well. Like I, I know... I know people are obsessed with maybe instant results or or big 
big wins early on, but I think winning three matches at this tournament is pretty damn good. Um, so I wanted to maybe look at Coco a bit more in the sense that she wasn't able to defend in New York Bush. And I think the, the idea that she is part of the top crew is not fully believable and in, in the sense that she's not on Sviantec Sabalenka level, but I think there's some ability to build that back up here in, in this final few months of the year. I would agree with you, yes. I think for the people that are going to have doubts, this is going to sound incredibly harsh, but let's let's go with it anyway, and we can always backtrack from it. The people that I think had had doubts of the the quote unquote validity of that US Open title last year, just based upon the people that she she played against, who she had to beat going through it, um, just the nature of who has dominated on the WTA and who's been like head and shoulders above the field on the in the WTA side this season, um, i.e. Sabalenka and, and Shiatek. There's go always going to be doubt. On the flip side of that, it is okay for her just to be a really good top five player in the world and not be the world number one. That is also completely fine. That is something that we can be very, very happy with uh, in terms of a player to support and root for. I I just kind of feel like she's 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 not better than those two. Uh, can, without being too reductive about no, that. No, yeah, I, I don't think she does anything <laughs> better than those two at the moment, right? And I, I know mm-hmm. in tennis, the beauty is you don't have to play them every time when you get to these tournaments, and, and that's how it works. But the likelihood is that she is going to run into at least one of them um, on the bigger stages. So can she get better than them at some things? I think there's an ability, but I also am not super confident. Yeah. Lest we forget as well that she's still incredibly young. Yeah. Like, yeah. We, we always look at this in the context of she's been on tour so long since she was 15. She's been on tour for five years now. She's only 20. It's, it's crazy to believe. Is there still another step that she has? Very possibly. It's very possible that she does. We could look very dumb in a few days. We're recording this a few days before the a big, big semifinal between Goff and Bedosa. Paula Bedosa Bush has been playing amazingly well post Tsitsipas, pass what a what a, a tale of two different players my god Bados pass paula is skyrocketing playing extremely well that'll be a tough test but maybe sabalink in the final which would be awesome to see you got jang still involved as well really loaded field yeah this beijing tournament's been fantastic just watching at it from a from a loaded field perspective um is is Bedosa Sissy Pass over? Is that- I thought so. I mean, the less I see from Steph these days, the better. I'm seeing a lot of AI, chat, GPT, cross-posting. Uh, <laughs> the, the stepping away from the game stuff and confining himself, I'm down with it. But also, please stop posting or go to Substack. Get a medium.com account, even anything else. Um, I'm curious on this without wanting to get into the inner workings and the life of this relationship. It's been so on off that I'm, <laughs> it's, I'm it's lost. Ross, of, it's of fully play. Ross racial territory now, and I honestly <laughs> I, I I can't be asked to keep up. What's the WWE equivalent of a tennis wedding? Like how would how would test this, and Steph McMahon test and Steph McMahon? Yeah, so married on court. <laughs> Middle Sunday or final didn't something Sunday. didn't yeah wasn't there like a horrific attack or, or obviously <laughs> staged during it but the fact I knew that so quickly is really upsetting but yeah that's the that's the reference okay anything else WTA before we get to parting shots sir I really thought you were going with anything else WWE <laughs> before we move on well now you say it it's been an interesting month I did watch the Mr McMahon documentary no nothing else WTA on my side. Okay, when we come back, we'll hit parting shots. We're going to talk Wada, Yannick, scheduling complaints, Caroline Garcia, Shang Shui, Chilich, all of that coming up next. Welcome back to the Open Air Podcast. Bush, it's time for parting shots. We've alluded to it several times. The acronym in the room. WADA is coming for our holy sword, Simon. WADA will not let us rest, even after Golden Boyani was given the U.S. Open title. They're pushing forward with their appeal, an appeal that, if successful, 
could bar Yannick Sinner from tennis for two years. Uh, I mentioned that they were asked about this in Beijing. Obviously, Yannick's been asked about this. A bunch of people around him have been asked about this. It's a distraction, obviously. But let's like, A, Simon, do you think it's actually possible that Wada wins this appeal? And B, do you think everyone is be like, is the reason maybe why everyone is being relatively calm about this is because they know that it's not going to be successful? Like how, what are the chances this goes through is what basically what I'm asking. That is a really good question. Uh, because I was, I was thinking the other way, right? I thought this has, I think he's got more of a, more chance to be pinned on this than he had in the other case. Like, because they are effectively arguing that he, um, they're not denying his sort of statement to it, but they're sort of suggesting at the same time, like, no, we get it, but you're still guilty. Like in the sense that you're right. Th there's still right. negligence here and you should be punished for that. Um, which I kind of think has some ground here personally. It seems like it has some substance to it. That being said, like the ins and outs of the legal ramifications of this, of whether or not he's going to be found guilty on this, I can't say, but just from a from from a distance, it seems like there's some merit here. Yeah, I don't know. I perhaps it's the the cynic in me. I can't imagine they'll let this happen. And by they, I mean whoever is making these decisions at the pinnacle of sport. It's one of my favorite things. I'm not talking about <laughs> they the pronoun. I'm talking about they more broadly. <laughs> It's just so funny if you if you listen to it in the English language of how much that gets used on a day to day basis. They. <laughs> Any workplace you go into, oh, they don't want us to do it. Who the fuck is they? It could the be system, literally anyone. Man. <laughs> the system, yeah. You know what I mean, though. It it really cannot happen. The the whole future of the sport is depending on him being around. Is that is that too bold to say? Probably. But I, as the the marketing schmuck I am, I, I kind of believe it. Can I can I read you the top part of uh, Russell Fuller's BBC article about it? I just just to revisit this because I think it's very funny. So bear with me a second. What a statement suggested is not questioning Sinner's explanation, but does believe he shares some of the blame. The Court of Arbitration of Sport will now decide whether the world number one should be held in any way responsible for a sequence of events which began with his physio using spray to cut a, to, to treat a cut on his finger. The spray, which contained Clostebol, had been passed on by Sinner's fitness coach, who had been brought into the team partly because of his anti-doping expertise. <laughs> Glover's massages, with hands which may or may not have been washed, and lesions on Sinner's skin resulted in two positive tests, the tribunal determined. While Sinner is free to play on, the case could take many months to resolve. Yeah, no shit. Also, just, it's so funny, <laughs> all of this. Like, the idea that the I know we've covered this many times, but the whole thing is just so ridiculous that it feels like it was made up in the back of a cab between two tournaments in like 15 minutes. Yeah, it's so stupid that it's believable it was unintentional, you know? Like it's one of those things where perhaps the stupidity defense might actually work. Yeah. I maintain this though, and I could be wrong. If I am wrong though, wow. Like what? What? Like. Dick Pound shouts to Wada. Anytime Wada was mentioned when I was growing up, I would always be like, "Yeah, Dick Pound, Canadian. He leads that." And that was like our weird claim to fame, because I, I felt like as Canadians, we were desperate to cling on to some sort of relevancy on the international stage. And if it wasn't through athletics themselves, it was through the doping regulator, which was Dick Pound. So, shouts to Wada. If this does actually happen, though, I'll be stunned. Simon, you are a little more hedgy. I don't know that I'm hedgy on this one. I I think we came off fairly strongly, the pair of us or this podcast did in terms of how we thought this one went. And yeah. more more broadly saying, like, don't treat us like we're five year olds. Uh, I still stand by that statement. I'm not gonna rope you into this. I should It's as that. if but <laughs> now it's as if a five year old did this. And now I'm like, okay, well, I guess. I guess. All right. Well I don't know a which... five year old with the best damn lawyers in town. That's probably more accurate. Yeah, which way to read this? Is this someone trying to pull over the wall out of our eyes and thinking we're five-year-olds? Or is it actually a bunch of five-year-olds who are this stupid? <laughs> Either way, it doesn't look good. Okay, so a few more serious things and then we'll get to a feel-good story before we end up Bush. Uh, players and the schedule. So this one came up 
a couple of times, actually. This came up with Carlos Alcaraz um, speaking, I want to say last week. Yeah, this is so I think it was last week. And obviously, you mentioned earlier the the uh, Stefano Sissipas may or may not have been chat GPT'd on his own opinions about the um, the state of the tour in, in terms of schedule and everything. Uh, Carlos Alcaraz made some comments as well. Um, Jack Draper also weighed on this. I think he had some very, very strong comments about this and, and words yeah. akin to uh, the tour is trying to kill us, which, you know, it's a good way to grab headlines. It's also not entirely uh, <laughs> inaccurate, I would say, just given the quantity of tennis. I think it's an interesting point in time on sport more broadly and the intersection of this story plus the one in football as well. I think if you have been following the world of sport more broadly, it's it's been inescapable. The, the rise in the number of games and the Spanish midfielder, uh, Rodri, very outspoken on this as well. Um, Champions League expansion, the number of games that are being played in the season. It's not just tennis, which is feeling the effects of this. You see it in the NFL, of course, as well, like with the expansion continuing talk to go to 18 games. We've already gone to 17. Um, so this infinite growth mindset, which I think is infected just about sort of parasitic idea that's infected just about every level of society and, and business is, is very deeply seated within inside of sport. This doesn't end. And I feel actually pretty good about this. Uh, one of the positions that I think we both came out fairly strongly on of saying that this, this doesn't change unless the players change it. I think the players are going to change this. I think yeah. this feels very strongly to me like it's more of a labor issue than it is from a moral perspective. I think the players are fucking fed up with this. And at some point, this is going to get really nasty. No, I'm with you. And and hell, I, it's, it's horrible. But I mean, Rodri th th tore his ACL like, what, a week after making those comments mm -hmm. about the, the Club World Cup and the incoming glut of fixtures that they're going to pile on in the summer, a free summer that they saw as, uh, as an open ticket to, to add on more games. No, totally. It doesn't matter who you support either. It could be your fidelis, could it be your enemies. I think I, I think we're in agreement supporting the players full stop. The product suffers as well, as you've been seeing, I think, um, regarding this kind of over overplaying. And it trickles down as well um, to the youth ranks and seeing what maybe is expected of people um, at the AAU level in, in like basketball or at the competitive level in soccer bush. So fully on board. Okay, Caroline Garcia, uh, sad story here. Yeah, and I think this is actually attached to the the kind of previous idea around the schedule and and how hectic it's been, which um, Garcia was citing both anxiety and panic attacks for ending her season last week, um, like very understandable. Uh, she was quoted as saying that she basically needs a reset and a step away from the grind of tennis. It goes hand in hand with the previous story. Like there's too much tennis, there's too much travel, there's way too much stuff expected of these athletes. The grind of going from one event to the other. Uh, did I see, I think this might have been where the Akira story came from, where she effectively had to go directly from the airport to play a game immediately to play a match in Shanghai. So it's going to become more of a sharp focus. I think there is a world here where there is enough overlap between the higher ranking and lower ranking players and between the two tours or every tour that we're going to start to see some movement. I really do believe that, that you don't, you haven't seen these levels of vitriol coming, I think, or like even words of, of the harshness of someone like Jack Draper, I think historically, I think this is the first real time that we're starting to see the knives come out for this. And I think at that point, powers that be might want to start having a look at this. All right, Simon, two happy good stories in tennis, question mark? It's true. <laughs> so Zhang Shui was riding a losing streak of... A Down long... bad. Down <laughs> bad, as we say. Down very, very bad. 24 successive defeats. She hadn't won in over... It was only two... Two years, 600 days, I believe. She won in the first round at the China Open. Um, she beat uh, McCartney-Kessler. 
everyone was pulling for her. There's some really good stories. I saw some TikToks around this as well of just, I think, uh, her camp bought her a cake as well, which I thought was really funny. Um, might have been a different story, but either way, it was it was funny regardless to, to see a uh, celebration like that. It's a long time. And I think yeah. perhaps not to connect everything back to the idea of, of schedule and the overlap here, but how much must it suck to go to 20 different tournaments directly, spend one day there or two days there, lose and have to fly somewhere else or take a bus or whatever it is. Tennis is nuts in terms of a sport when it comes to this side of things. 100%. No, it's, it's, I just, uh, and it's a complete like shock to your system if what you, if what you imagine traveling is You're like, woo, I'm going, I'm getting to the airport and have some drinks and chill by the pool. It's like, no, you're into some. Some holiday and shuttle to a match on the outer courts, getting pummeled by the 120th ranked player from South Africa who's been waiting there for two days. It's all right, back to the airport for a seven hour red eye um, in between two people close to the bathroom. It's like, all right, this is pro tennis, man. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's such a grind. And I think it's like, it's why I, I kind of. I mean, it's not all glorious and roses and like as much, I, I love the movie Challengers for several reasons, but I do think it paints like this kind of grind in a, in a realistic light uh, about what it means. So shouts to Persevering and then shouts to Marin Cilic too, Bush. Marin Cilic, Grand Slam champion, still fighting and winning. Yeah, one in Hangzhou is, became the lowest ranked player ever. Uh, in history to win an ATP Tour title, currently was ranked 777th in the world. An amazing story, 36 years of age. Uh, we always forget, I think, the broad, broad tennis world. Grand Slam champion. Yes, did win a Grand Slam in that very, very strange uh, US Open, the way that it unfolded. Still realer than the 2020 US Open, though. Don't get it twisted. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone involved in that had to beat legitimate people. It was <laughs> completely fine, despite the wind playing complete havoc with that tournament. Yeah, it was that was weird. It was legit. The jet streams, man. The jet streams, indeed. I have one other non-tennis related thing before parting shots. Could I? Okay. Can I briefly touch on it here? Yes. I was watching Bill Belichick. <laughs> oh God! Oh my God! What? <laughs> This is a broad, broad question that I think I wanted to ask our our audience and to potentially think about it. Because I thought it was really insightful, which is that, or maybe I just never thought about it in this way. So he was basically making the argument that in his in his view, like the idea that you make adjustments at half time or any of this sort of thing is kind of nonsense. And really the game of football is around seeing what your opponent has done and then making adjustments to it. And the fourth quarter basically is everyone already knows what each other is doing. So it's about kind of like staying in games, trying to like obviously get an advantage. But by the end, everyone kind of knows what each other is doing. There's not a whole lot of secrecy left, which to me was like, I've never actually considered that way. And really yeah. from that perspective, tennis is very similar to that, which is that if you can just hang around in a match, you can learn the patterns of your opponent so simply by just being there and just watching what they do, how they like to win points. And I think perhaps that combined with the greatest player like in the history of of our sport to be able to do that in someone like Novak Djokovic, who's just, all right, I've seen what you can do. I will take away that one thing that you can do. And now you can't win. I thought it was just a really insightful comment. And it's one of those things you don't really think about normally. No, I, he's good. I hate to say it, but he's he's good at this whole um, talking about sports stuff, clearly. So, uh, no, it's it's super interesting. And, yeah, I mean, it checks out and it kind of fits or or works for multiple sports um, that when you think about it. Okay. Uh, two challenges remaining, Bush. I'll go first. In all my years, I had not watched the original Point Break. But thanks to Canopy, <laughs> I did watch it with my partner. I was devastated. Spoilers ahead, sorry, so you can shut this off. But I was devastated by Bodhi's betrayal. Top-notch movie. Have some qualms with the ending in Australia, but overall, top-notch movie, would recommend. What a what a recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've done two festivals since the last time we, we spoke. I was at the Vancouver Fringe Festival, which ran 
in early September. I watched 20 live plays wow. during that period of time, which was very cool. Um, Vancouver International Film Festival is currently ongoing here. And I think about 10 films and with the half a week left to go on that. And I think the one film that I wanted to shout out was a documentary called Grand Theft Hamlet, which is a British documentary about making Hamlet the play inside of GTA Online. <laughs> wow. It is as it's kind of done in that uh, that machinima style, if, if you're familiar with it, yeah. like the concept of taking the in-game characters and and dubbing them and voicing them. Um, it's it's wonderful. It's much more emotional than I think you would expect it to be. Uh Everyone was bawling their eyes out at the end of it, the people sitting around me, which I was shocked at. I never thought I'd be in a situation like that. I, I thought it was I thought it was very touching and I, it's well worth the time if you can get to see it at some point. Wonderful. Those are Siskel and Ebert numbers, sir. A lot of plays, a lot of movies. Love it. Might explain why I currently may or may not have COVID, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, we'll leave it there. A reminder, we are on patreon.com forward slash open era. Join us there, get the show ad free, get it early on Sundays, plus join the Discord where my tennis knowledge has been kept up to speed by our lovely friends there. So join us at Patreon. And that is it for producer Dylan on the ones and twos. Thank you for listening. For Simon and I, we'll talk to you next week. Bye.